Okay, moving on, we are going to hear about updates in radiation oncology, and I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Namit Gerber, who is an assistant professor here at Perlmutter Cancer Center in the Department of Radiation Oncology. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'm going to go through the highlights of the radiation oncology uh, talks at San Antonio, and uh, not surprisingly, there is some overlap with Dr. Schnabel's talk, but I'll try to focus a little bit on the radiation aspects of those overlapping topics. Uh, so the first talk to present was a talk given by Dr. Reshma Jagsi, who's a professor of radiation oncology at the University of Michigan. Uh, she gave an overview lecture looking at advanced technologies to optimize outcomes and minimize uh, toxicities. So one of the techniques that she highlighted in her talk is something called the breath hold technique. Um, as you can see in these slides from her talk, uh, in this uh, view over here, which is essentially a side profile of the chest, these are the ribs over here, in red is the heart, and in blue are the borders of the radiation beam that you would need to treat uh, an early stage breast cancer after a lumpectomy. And as you can see, based on a typical uh, patient's uh, anatomy, the heart is really coming into this radiation beam right here. Um, and this has been a challenge for decades for us when we're treating left-sided breast cancer. How do we minimize the dose to the heart? And one very elegant but quite simple technique is to have uh, patients hold their breath. Um, and you can see that when patients hold their breath, the heart moves out of that field because the lungs are expanding with air. Um, and this is a, a really exciting technique. We actually got it at NYU about a year ago. Um, and it's something we routinely use in left-sided breast cancer patients who for various reasons cannot be treated prone, which is face down, which is another technique for avoiding the heart. Uh, but if women are being treated on their back and need left-sided radiation in specific cases, this is a really wonderful technique. And I just took some slides from our own experience here since we've implemented this just to show it in cross-section. So this is a cross-section view. Um, uh, you can see this is the sternum, the breastbone. This is the spine, the back. And the patient in this CAT scan is lying on her back with her legs coming out of the screen and her head going in. So uh, here is the left breast over here. And over here, where my pointer is on the left, this is just what a CAT scan looks like with a woman breathing normally. And on the right, this is what that same slice, the same level, looks like when you take a deep breath. You can see the sliver of air comes between the heart and the breast. And we're essentially able to get our beams in over here without going through the heart. So this is a really wonderful technique. And down here just shows the beam arrangements. Over here with just regular breathing, you can see the beam is sort of really touching the heart. And over here with that breath hold, again, we have all this lung over here and the beams are staying away from the heart. Um, another technique she spoke about is protons. So protons are at a very different stage than breath holds. Uh, protons are, I would, say, I would say, are still experimental in early stage breast cancer. Um, and in fact, what Dr. Jagsey talked about was a, a trial that's going on now. Um, at multiple centers that is um, taking women with um, intermediate risk breast cancer and randomizing them to regular photon x-ray radiation, which is what is the standard, and protons. And we're very much awaiting the results of this study, which is in its early, early stages. Um, in the same session, there was an additional talk by Dr. Candice Correa, who um, is another professor of radiation oncology, and she presented the update of the partial breast irradiation guidelines, which came out um, in the year preceding this San Antonio breast conference. So um, historically, any woman who had a lumpectomy needs radiation to the whole breast. Um, and in 2011, ASTRA, which is our national um, organization, issued the first guidelines um, stating that some women don't need their whole breast treated, they could have just part of the breast treated. This is called partial breast irradiation. Um, and these guidelines were updated in 2016 and presented uh, at San Antonio. Um, so just by, by note of introduction from Dr. Correa's talk, whole breast radiotherapy after breast conservation surgery reduces the risk of local recurrence by um, you know, about 67%, but it requires several weeks of daily treatments. The majority of local recurrences are within or near the lumpectomy cavity, and as a result, 
um, you know, the the uh, idea came about about just treating part of the breast where the tumor was. And this um, is given in many different dosing regimens, but it's usually about one week of radiation. Some places do it twice daily. Here at NYU, we do it once a day. So these are the prior guidelines from 2009. Um, there are multiple techniques available for partial breast irradiation, including external beam radiation, which is what we use at NYU. Um, there's brachytherapy, where the radiation is placed directly inside the breast. And then there's intraoperative radiotherapy, where, again, the radiation is given at the time of surgery. Um, so these are some of the changes in the guidelines that I'll go through and that were highlighted in this talk. So. Um, one thing that was changed is in the suitable category here in green, the age for partial breast radiation was lowered from 60 in the old guidelines to 50 uh, in this newer version of the guidelines. One thing I will say about this is that you know 50 is somewhat of an ambiguous age when it comes to uh, menopausal status. And um, you know, at, at our um, partial breast program here at NYU, we use premenopausal and postmenopausal, which is often around age 50, but perhaps a little bit more biologically individualized than a blanket age 50. Um, the other thing that was changed, which is a major change in these guidelines, is that um, in the earlier version of the guidelines, the only patients eligible for partial breast had to have had invasive breast cancer, stage one breast cancer, and now the guidelines allow partial breast radiation to be used for patients with DCIS, with stage zero breast cancer. And there are very specific um, restrictions on who with DCIS is eligible for this, but the guidelines do include low-risk DCIS patients. Um, so those are the major changes to the guidelines. The other um, requirements to be appropriate or suitable for partial breast, which are unchanged, is that someone cannot have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. They have to have negative margins. Uh, there cannot be something called lymphovascular invasion. It has to be estrogen receptor positive. Um, it has to be unicentric, meaning there's only one area of disease. Um, and invasive ductal carcinoma is highlighted as suitable, whereas invasive lobular carcinoma is seen as cautionary. So these are unchanged. Um, and then just one slide to show how we give partial breast at NYU. And right now we have an ongoing uh, protocol open that's comparing three treatments versus five treatments. Uh, this is um, a woman lying prone, the position I, I alluded to before, where someone's face down. Um, this is the breast hanging down. Here's the other breast that's pulled onto a table. And the radiation is between these two yellow lines, and you can see that we're able to target just part of the breast with these mini beams. Um, and this has been the technique we've used here. Okay, so the next talk I wanna talk about um, was given by Dr. Warnberg. Um, it's um, looking at DCIS, these stage zero breast cancer patients, and estimating the risk and how radiation affects that risk. Um, and the title of his talk was a validation of a DCIS biological risk profile in a randomized study for radiation therapy uh, from the Swede Swedish DCIS study. So generally in DCIS, we know that if you just give breast conserving surgery alone, this is for all comers, the 10 year risk of having um, an ipsilateral breast event, which essentially is either a recurrence of DCIS or invasive cancer in that breast, is about 28% for all comers. And with radiation, that risk drops to 13%, so more than a 50% reduction with radiation. And various factors affect the risk of it coming back and the reduction that you get with radiation. So size is one factor. The larger the DCIS, the more likely it is to come back and the bigger benefit you get from radiation. Similarly for high grade, the more likely it is to come back and the bigger benefit from radiation. And of course the margin status, positive or close margins, increase the risk of the DCIS coming back. One of the many trials that formed this meta-analysis in 2010 was the Swedish trial. What they did in this trial is they took women with DCIS um, and they essentially gave some of them radiation and some of them had no radiation. And again, across the board, those patients who had the radiation had a lower risk of both invasive and in situ, meaning more DCIS recurrences. So what's novel, this study has been known for a long time. What's novel about this data from San Antonio is that the investigators were trying to determine 
who really has this higher risk of occurrence and therefore who really needs the radiation. And this is something that we've been working on for decades. We're always, as, as breast cancer oncologists, always trying to figure out who needs the radiation and who doesn't. And we have many clinical factors that help us, age, grade, size, margins. And what this study does is it adds some um, biological signatures to the clinical factors. So they look at the hormone receptor genes, genes that are involved in stress response, HER2, proliferation index, and cell cycle markers. And they use all of these factors, including the clinical factors, to arrive at a decision score, which is from zero to 10. Low risk is zero to three, elevated risk is greater than three. And they had multiple validations. They started with um, one, um, one cohort, and then they validated it in a Kaiser Permanente cohort from, from this country. And here are the results. So they look at the benefit at 10 years according to this decision, right, this genomic clinical profile. And so first, just to go to this graph, half, about half of the patients, 243, were in this low risk category, and 263 were in this elevated risk category. So already we know this is a good assay because you're able to discriminate about half and half, right? If all of the patients were low risk, this would not be a good assay. Um, and then if you look at, so this is the, the reduction in risk in invasive breast cancer. So patients who were low risk had a hazard ratio of 0.84, meaning they were 84% less likely. Um, with the radiation, they were 84% less likely to have it come back. I'm not explaining that so well. If the risk is 100% without the radiation, the risk is 84% with the radiation. Um, and that p-value is not significant, meaning this, the, these statistics were not um, robust enough to show an effect. In, con, you know, in contrary to that, patients who had an elevated risk, had, their risk went from 100% to 24%, so a bigger reduction, and it was a statistically significant um, effect. Um, if they looked at all recurrences, both DCIS and invasive breast cancer, you see a bigger reduction for both groups, and for both those groups, the, it's a significant effect. Um, and then this is just another way to represent the data in terms of absolute risk. So for the low risk group, and this is just invasive breast cancer again, not DCIS, you only see a 1% absolute difference from radiation, whereas with the elevated risk group, you see a 9% absolute benefit. And all of these numbers would be about doubled if you include the DCIS uh, recurrences. So it'd be about a 2% absolute difference uh, versus an 18% difference. Um, and so the conclusions of, of this uh, talk was that this is a very uh, useful, potentially, uh, profile for how we can stratify patients with DCIS in terms of who's going to benefit from radiation. Okay, so the next talk Dr. Schnabel introduced to us, this is the uh, talk about women less than 40 and uh, their risk of arm swelling and decreased range of motion. So I'm just going to quickly skip ahead to look a little bit more closely at the effect of radiation. Um, so if we go over here um, and just compare the patients, so in the, in the breast conserving therapy group, almost everyone got radiation. So there, of course, the biggest difference in terms of arm swelling is the kind of axillary surgery they had, not the radiation. Um, although when, then when we look at the mastectomy patients, um, as Dr. Schnabel pointed out, the sentinel lymph node group goes from 4% without radiation to 11% with radiation. So that's a, you know, a pretty big jump. And the axillary lymph node dissection group goes from 19% to 25%, also a jump. Similarly, for the range of motion, you go from 20% to 41% with the sentinel lymph node biopsy and from 34% to 46% with the axillary lymph node dissection, all of which really points at a real role of radiation in these complications. Um, it's something that's very important in terms of um, you know, things we can do to um, first uh, discuss these effects and what we can do to um, prevent them and to mitigate them. And of course, radiation is not the only factor that, that's important. You know, the, the body mass index, the financial status, the T stage, these are all factors that were also important. But for sure, the radiation is something that um, clearly pay, plays a role in, the, in these, um, these long-term complications. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about was actually not presented at San Antonio because it just came out this month. But I figured since we have everyone in the room looking at updates, and this is a very important update that I would present a, a very quick uh, few minutes about this. So um, this came out 
I guess it doesn't even have a date yet because it's still in press technically. Um, Astro, which I alluded to before that issues these guidelines, has just issued new guidelines for whole breast irradiation. The last time Astro issued guidelines was 2011. So th these updates are a long time in the making. Um, and th what these guidelines really talk about are what's the best number of weeks for women who need radiation to the whole breast after a lumpectomy? Who needs a boost dose, right? That extra week we sometimes give uh, just to where the tumor was. And how can we standardize these things, which until now have really been very physician and institution dependent. Um, so the first thing they say, which is very novel, is that the preferred dose is um, this three weeks of radiation to the whole breast. Um, you know, the, the older, more historical is the five weeks, and then uh, the three weeks has, has um, you know, was shown in large studies um, over the past few decades, but the uptake in this has been variable. And so th these guidelines come out unequivocally and say the preferred dose is the shorter course. And they say that this is true regardless of the grade of the tumor, if patients are getting chemotherapy, whether it's right or left-sided, what age the patient is, and whether it's DCIS or invasive cancer. Now the last, these are all new in that until these guidelines came out, there was some question of whether women with high-grade disease could get the shorter course. There was a question of if it's safe to give the shorter course of radiation if women are getting or have gotten chemotherapy. There was a question of whether for the left side it was safe to give the shorter course because of the heart. Um, there was a real question about giving the shorter course to women less than 50. The old guidelines specified that you had to be 50 or above to get the shorter course of radiation. So this is really um, an important update for younger women. And DCIS is also somewhat controversial because all of the studies that established this shorter course of radiation were done in invasive cancer. So these are all really important updates. And then the, the second issue they dealt with is who needs a boost, who needs an extra week of radiation just to where the tumor was. Um, and you know what the guidelines say is anyone who's less than 50 with in, or, or 50 with invasive disease, someone who's between age 51 to 70 with high grade disease or a positive margin, um, you can omit the boost in women who are over 70 with estrogen receptor positive tumors, lower intermediate grade and negative margins. And anyone who doesn't fall into these categories, it's still at the discretion of the physician. Um, but they are sort of giving some clearer guidelines for who can or does not need a boost. Uh, and then for patients with DCIS, those who are age less than or equal to 50 with high grade or close margins, and uh, they state that you can omit a boost in DCIS patients greater than 50 with low risk features. And again, the DCIS patients who fall in between these, it's at the discretion of the physician. So national guidelines are, of course, never a substitute for individual physician judgment. But I do think it's very helpful that these are now out there and can sort of guide uh, physicians across the country in terms of um, what's considered um, standard of care. So thank you to everyone, to my colleagues, and to all of our patients here at the Perlmutter Cancer Center.